uh, for joining today. Um, it's really lovely to be invited and I'm looking forward to, uh, to the webinar. So, um, as Ilke so kindly um, provided an overview, my name is Jennifer uh, Chapman. I'm the program manager for Authorate. Um, I work at INAS. So you can see here on the first slide at the top, INAS, Research and Knowledge at the Heart of Development. Now, INASP is actually the overarching organization um, within which AuthorAid sits. Um, it's a large organization, and we focus on putting research and knowledge at the heart of development. We initially started out as a, a group of librarians um, about 25 years ago, working in Oxford in England, um, who wanted to work with libraries in some low-income countries who struggled to get access to resources, so journals and books, e-resources. Um, and since then, we've grown into quite a large organization, and we have um, sort of four distinct programs. So I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of INASP and Authorate. Um, and I'm happy to take questions at the end, or if you want to type them in the side, I'm happy to answer them as well. Um, hopefully, I won't be telling you anything you uh, know already, um, but again, if you want clarification on anything, please feel free to ask me at the end. So on the slide, you can see this is the homepage for INASP. So INASP actually stands for the International Network for the Availability of Scientific Publications, um, which goes back to our original uh, purpose, which I explained. Um, and you can see on our homepage, we've just launched a new strategy. This is a five-year strategy to advance some of our bigger areas of work. Our key programs are um, working on access to e-resources, um, working to inform policymaking with evidence, um, something called Journals Online, which increases the visibility of uh, research that's being done in low- and middle-income countries. We also have country pages that explain the work that we do in each country in these areas. Um, and AuthorAid, of course, which is the program that I manage. So you can see both of the um, website URLs at the bottom there. Feel free to visit um, either of them. So I'll talk a little bit about access to research. And the way we do this is we work with publishers and library consortia. So what we mean by consortia is we mean by we create or uh, pull together groups um, of libraries and librarians in country on a big round table so we can all work together effectively to um, increase access to resources either at a discounted rate or for free. So you can see at the minute we've been able to uh, access or provide access for over 50,000 journals, 20,000 ebooks, and with over 50 publishers. So we have quite a close relationship with publishers, and we have somebody on our team who works with the bigger publishers to ensure that they are constantly um, keeping in mind the needs of researchers who don't necessarily have the funds or the infrastructure at their institution to access these things. Um, we at the minute are working or have worked with over 800 institutions across Africa and again this is through these consortia that we work with at the national level um, and this involves universities, research institutes, teaching hospitals, government departments and we estimate that we infected around 1.9 million students and researchers. So the link at the bottom of the screen will take you to our open access resource page which will be a um, useful list of resources that are open access and available for anybody um, in case it sounds like you probably have seen all of these already. It's a very comprehensive course that you've been taking. But just in case you haven't, uh, feel free to visit that. And just an example of this is the work that we've done with the Kenya Library and Information Services Consortium. So this is something that we work with at a national level, like I mentioned. We provided access to over 58,000 journals, and this is for over 129 institutions in Kenya. And these figures essentially cover subscription journals, so paid for content. It doesn't necessarily include all of the open access materials, so that's on top of that. So despite the work that we're doing, though, we realize that we're still not seeing a lot of use of this material. So researchers might not necessarily know that it's there and available for them. So what we're doing in these library consortia is we're trying to increase the visibility um, of access. So that there are things that are available and that you just have to know where they are to find them. 
Another one of our original um, programs is something called Journals Online. So this is a project that is, as I've mentioned, aiming to improve the accessibility and visibility of developing country resource. So, sorry, research. So what it does is it provides a, essentially a secure platform for online journals. Um, to feature their journals and their articles. Um, within NAS, we then work very closely with the journal editors um, and an in-country coordinator to ensure that they have all of the capacity that they need to run their journals um, effectively. So trying to work with them to build it up to the quality level of what we expect from so-called high-impact journals. At the minute, we have 357 journals across the JOLs. Um, this is over 39,000 articles, and 95% of those are open access full text. And as you can see, we've had over 34 million downloads since 2007, which we're very proud of. These are the journals that we have at the minute, and as I mentioned, they tend to be organized within country or within a region. So there's Bangladesh, uh, Latin America, which focuses on Central America. We also have Mongolia, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. And those of the minute are managed in collaboration with NASP. So we have someone on our team who's working to build their capacity to manage their sites uh, and to bring them up to a certain quality level. Now, African Journals Online, Philippine Journals Online, and Vietnam Journals Online have been handed over in country. So those we initially worked with to help set up, and we've since been able to hand them over. Um, and those are completely now run without any support from NASP, which is really the idea of, of what we're trying to do at NASP. Um, so you're welcome to go visit any of those uh, any of those websites. Um, almost all the research that I mentioned is open access. This is an example of one of the websites. So this is the African Journals Online, which does cover all countries in Africa. And this is the Uganda page. Now the next, um, the next program that we do is called Evidence-Informed Policymaking. This really is the idea of ensuring that policymakers in low-income and middle-income countries are ensuring that they're using the evidence being produced by their researchers um, when they're developing policy. And this is particularly useful for things like climate change, food security, really key hot topic issues that local researchers are doing research on. Um, and that, you know, the policymakers and the parliamentarians might not necessarily um, be taking into consideration when they're drafting policy. So this was a three-year program that we're just coming up to the end of now. And the belief, uh, the belief for this is that you need to have at least three, act, three factors to be put in place um, in order for evidence-informed policymaking to take place. And that includes, so that includes having individuals with the skills to access and use research. Processes for handling research, so this means ensuring that research is available, that people know where to find it. And then there needs to also be a kind of wider enabling environment of engaged citizens, media, and civil society. So the work that we've done with this program has not necessarily just been with working with parliamentary, sort of parliaments. It's also been with working with some of the key civil society organizations or civil service organizations um, that also have a stake in this. So why does this matter? Coming out of this, we've produced a toolkit. Uh, it's really comprehensive. It's quite a large toolkit. It's available on our website. Uh, you can see the URL at the bottom. If you go to our homepage on NASP, you'll also find it quite easily. And this toolkit, toolkit is broken down into four distinct modules. Really, the first part gives you an introduction to evidence-informed policymaking, why it's important, what the different kinds of evidence are. The second gives you a search strategy. So how do you access different types of evidence in developing countries? How do you use networks? How do you search databases? Um, and again, this might not necessarily be something that's just useful for policymakers, but it could be useful for many researchers. The third part is about assessing evidence. So how do you know which evidence is good? How can you analyze the source? How do you know about the credibility? How can you figure out if there's bias involved or if the methodology is any good? Um, and the fourth module is on communicating evidence, and this is something that through AuthorAid, a lot of researchers I've been working with have been asking about and asking after. So they want to know how they can communicate their research in a way that the public or a policymaker can understand it. And this section in this module gives a really 
detailed and good overview about how to produce a policy brief, how to produce a memo, how to put together something that's very high level and that gives the headlines for the research that you produce so that um, they're not getting you know, uh, lost in the detail or the methodology. So what are the key findings? So again, I recommend you have a look at that. It's a, essentially a very useful toolkit. You're also able to take any of these modules and run a workshop on them. So if you wanted to run a workshop on module four on how to communicate evidence, all of the tools are here to do that. This is just an example of, of putting evidence into policy making. So this is a, a research from Bhutan, a researcher from Bhutan who took the author aid writing course, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, and in that course, he realized that there's so much research being produced in his country, but very little of it was being communicated. And he really wanted to ensure that the research that he was doing would have an impact on people's lives. So he did quite a bit of research on developing a solar water heater. Um, and through um, sort of communicating this research with communities and in other places, he's been able to have quite a lot uh, of impact. And uh, in one instance, he was able to uh, sort of decrease the amount of water used in a hotel by 40% as a result of the solar water heater. So a very practical local implication. Um, he also published his research on SciDev.net, um, and that's an audience of up to 32 million people. Okay, so AuthorAid, this is the reason why I'm here. Let's talk about AuthorAid. Um, AuthorAid is a program that was launched um, over 10 years ago, and it's been refined in the past five years to support researchers in lower and middle income countries. And how do we do that? So we provide online training in research and proposal writing. So this is all about communicating research. How do we communicate research effectively? We've also um, offered a mentoring support platform. So this pairs mentors around the world, or sorry, people around the world with mentors who are either sort of mid-career or senior career researchers. Um, through this platform, we, through the mentoring platform, we also encourage collaboration. We've also done quite a lot of work on embedding research and proposal writing within institutions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while. And one of the more recent initiatives that we've started is about addressing gender inequalities in academic institutions. So how might that affect the output of research? This is a map, uh, an infographic essentially of our author aid network. So this includes anybody who's registered on the website. At the minute we have more than 14,000 registered researchers and this is from around 174 countries. And you can see our, our biggest network at the minute is Africa, followed uh, quite closely behind by sort of Central and Southeast Asia. And we have growing networks in, um, in sort of Latin America and Northern Asia. This is the AuthorAid homepage, so authorAid.info, as I mentioned. We also have a, a Spanish website. So you can see at the top, on the left-hand side, you have the option of English or Spanish. We do have plans at some point in the future to launch a French website uh, as well. Um, and, you know, this is quite a busy homepage, but you can see there are quite a lot of things that we um, offer. Now, before I go into AuthorAid, I thought it might be interesting for you to hear what researchers have told us. So we have a discussion forum. It has over, uh, sorry, that's a typo. It actually has over 1,000 members. Um, this is a discussion group. Anybody can join it, and you can sort of talk to other researchers, share your problems, ask questions, and a team and a group of people will, you know, answer your questions very quickly. So last year, we sort of did a very informal straw poll of members, asking them what their biggest challenge in publishing or communicating their research is. And here are the top 10 answers. So you can see there's a lack of research funding that's at the top, and I think that's probably um, something that's not necessarily uh, just applicable to researchers from low-income countries. I think that's a universal issue. Writing in the English language is second, followed by identifying the most suitable genuine journals, delays with the peer review process, getting their papers accepted through peer review, publication costs and things like article processing charges, lack of mentors or people to check and review their manuscripts, the academic writing style that's 
required of publishing in certain journals, journals a poor or insufficient laboratory equipment, and difficulty communicating your research to policymakers and the public. So these are what we've been told. I'm sure there are many others. Um, it would be really great to hear your thoughts on this at the end uh, of my presentation. So please let me know if you agree with this list, if you think there are any more challenges, or if you think there's anything that's been missed. And as I mentioned, this is the discussion group. So there's the, uh, the URL at the bottom of the page. Anybody is free and welcome to join this group. Um, and if you are a researcher who's starting out in your career and you do have questions, I would certainly recommend that you join this. If nothing else, it's a really great opportunity just to see what people are talking about and to get to know some other people in the community. So Authorate also offers, offers online courses. So these are free. These are fully free, fully open online courses in research and grant proposal writing. Um, we offer them twice a year. Our next course is going to be taking place from April 18th to June 12th. This is going to be an eight-week course. Uh, essentially, the first six weeks is going to be our standard author aid writing uh, and research course. And the last two weeks will be focused on how to write a grant proposal. These are really popular courses. As you can see at the bottom, um, we've only had uh, three large courses since April, so we've already had 4,700 participants from 121 countries. Um, we generally get about 1,000 to 2,000 people joining each of these courses, um, and it's actually a great atmosphere. We have some facilitators from INAS, we have some of our mentors who facilitate, we have some of our in-country partners who now facilitate on the forums. Um, it's a very active course, lots of really good discussion. It's run twice a year, as I mentioned. So if you missed the one in April, you can't attend it. There will be another one happening in October. And we also offer the same course on our Spanish site uh, in Spanish, and that will be starting in May. So the online course, you know, goes over the, uh, you know, publishing 101. So it'll talk about literature reviews, publishing ethics, how to write an appropriate, a high quality academic paper, how to get published how to write a grant proposal, and how to avoid predatory journals. And these are probably all things that you've covered in your course so far, but sometimes they're a good refresher for people um, or for new researchers who've just started their PhD or just started their master's and they want to know about this. I should just say at the bottom here, this, this picture of Molly, who's a course participant in Zimbabwe, um, we did a, a sort of a survey. We asked people to send in their photos of them doing their research from around the world. You can go to the AuthorAid website and you can find um, all of the photos that were submitted. Uh, we had some really great ones of people taking our course, doing their research from all different places in the world. And just on the, uh, quickly on the question of uh, predatory journals, if you're not aware of Think, Check, Submit, I'd really suggest you have a look at the website. Um, unfortunately, predatory journals are becoming more and more of an issue. And Think, Check, Submit is really just an excellent checklist to help you determine if the journal that you want to publish in is appropriate. So some of the questions that are in the checklist are things like, do you or your colleagues know the journal? Can you easily identify the publisher? Can you contact the publisher? Is the journal clear about how the peer review process is done and what type of peer review it is? Those types of things. And certainly something that should be bookmarked and you should refer to um, as, as regularly as possible. So the other uh, big sort of offer of AuthorAid is this mentoring platform. And this is because we, we know that one of the main challenges that many researchers face is the shortage of mentors. Um, in many institutions, there might not be somebody who can mentor you or they might not have the time. So the idea of this platform is that you have a network of researchers from around the world who you can easily um, talk to and ask questions of. Um, it really essentially pairs experienced mentors, so this can in the past, I should say, and historically this is researchers from North America and Europe, but it certainly has been over time now becoming a global set of mentors, so mentors from all over the world. And it can be support in any stage of a writing project. So it can be from support with the methodology, so that could be one task. It can be helping with uh, a peer review. It can be uh, language editing. 
or you can find a mentor who will help you with your career. We have lots of examples of mentors um, and mentee relationships that have developed over time and really led to some collaboration, um, some joint authorship. So um, the mentoring platform is really just an opportunity to talk to researchers from other places and start a relationship. This is an example of the of the researcher page. So on our homepage, you'll see on the right hand side, find a researcher. And you're welcome to go on there and search for anything. So you can search for the topic, you can search for agriculture, you can search for a, a country if you want to find other researchers within your country. And this is a, a step that you can take to either find a mentor who you want to approach for a mentoring relationship or merely to find another researcher who you want to talk about talk, or talk to about possibly collaborating. So for example, if you do this today or yesterday as I did, um, you search for agriculture, you'll find there are 723 researchers who have labeled this as their subject area in our system. This is already quite a large group of people who you'd be able to talk to about your area of research. And when you do search, you'll see a list like this. So you'll see people's names, their photos, if they have one, the institution that they come from, and their status, which is the most important, which will say they're available for mentoring. And sometimes, as you can see at the very bottom, somebody will say the support level that they're happy to provide. So in this instance, Ian O'Neill has said he's happy to provide editing, long-term mentoring and support. So he doesn't necessarily just want to help somebody with reviewing their paper. He'd like to have a long-term relationship. This is an example of someone's profile when you click on their name. This is the type of information that you'll see. So you'll see a further breakdown of the types of subjects that they're interested in. And this is just a snapshot of our current mentors. It's probably about a year old, so this gives you an idea of the countries that our mentors come from. As you can see, we have quite a lot in the United States, which I think is because of the initial network of mentors that we had who started, followed by India and the UK. Um, and very, very slowly, we're starting to get researchers from other places in the world, as I mentioned. And this is a list of our active mentees. And again, this is about a year old, this data. So we've got quite much larger numbers uh, than in this list. But this really, I think, is helpful giving you a snapshot of the countries that are represented within the authorate network. This is a case study, an example of somebody whose career has been shaped by a mentoring relationship. So Joshua Okanya is a crop entomologist in Uganda. He researched sweet potato pests. His research showed that sweet potato pests are more prevalent at higher temperatures, so climate change is a huge threat. And this obviously affects food security, which is an issue in Uganda. Uh, he really struggled for a long time to get his research published, um, but in 2013, he joined the AuthorAid Network and he started a mentoring relationship with two mentors, so one in the UK and one in Australia. And he specifically says that their support helped him to publish his research. So he was able to publish four papers in 2013 and five in 2014. Um, one of his papers has been cited 18 times. And one of his papers that was published in a, in a Springer open access journal has been accessed almost 2,000 times. So he's now been able to speak at conferences internationally, including in Berlin and China. Um, and he really believes that this is because of the relationship that he had with an author aid mentor that gave him both the confidence um, and the tools to pull his research together into something he could publish that could then move on to other things. So I think in a lot of instances, mentoring relationships are as much about building confidence as a researcher so that people know that they have the ability to become a researcher who's published, to become a leader in their field. Um, that's really the, the sort of nuts and bolts of a mentoring relationship. The other thing that we have on the AuthorAid website is a resource library. Um, and there are so many resources on there, you can actually get lost when you're looking. We've got over 700 items in quite a lot of languages, as you can see. We have presentations, articles, um, all types of things. You can be pointed to uh, an external course on, on taking data methodology that's free. And when you do search, you can search by topic, resource type, language. Um, I should also say, and because we've been getting a lot of requests for this lately, 
we do in fact have full sets of course materials for a workshop in research writing and grant proposal writing. Um, we have entire course packs, we have facilitator notes, so if you did want to run this type of course at your institution, we do have all of the tools to do so. And this is just a snapshot of the types of things that you might find when you look on the resources page. So as you can see on the right hand column, we have all kinds of topics, many things that have been added over the years. So anything that you might want advice on, I'd suggest looking in the resource library. One of the more recent things that we've been focusing on is supporting women researchers, which I think I mentioned earlier. Um, and this was prompted by working with the University of Dodoma in Tanzania. Now, we started a relationship with them to, um, to focus on research writing. So they wanted to run workshops on writing. As they started this process, they realized that, in fact, some of the gender inequalities that existed at their university were slowing down their progress with helping their researchers. And so they sort of stopped working on that and started working on um, figuring out a way to better support women researchers and figuring out what the obstacles are. So you can see at the bottom they say, you know, they had 694 current academic staff members. This was in 2015. Only 175 of those staff members were female. And there were no women in senior leadership or college principal positions. And this is quite a big university, about 20,000 students, and they have seven colleges, and yet they had no female leaders. And so we're focusing now on this quite a bit more because we do realize that it, it is a barrier to some of the other objectives that we want to achieve. And we do think that in many countries, you know, women do face more challenges than men in pursuing research and academic careers. They're often cons constrained by family roles, expectations, and these these uh, activities and these expectations often interrupt their education or limit it. Um, they sometimes find that within the institutions, you know, the policies and practices fail to address their needs. Insecurity and harassment are fairly common. And for example, they might find obstacles in completing their field research. So one example we have is of a fisheries researcher in Tanzania who said to us that she was unable to collect her data because she was unable to get on the boat with the fisherman who said that, you know, it would be bad luck if women got onto his boat. These are the types of things that limit a woman's ability to progress in her research career. And the other thing we have at the bottom there is called the leaky pipeline, which is common uh, not only in Africa and other places, but also in the UK, also in Canada. Um, and this is where this is, it's called a leaky pipeline because it essentially means that as women progress through their careers, they tend to drop out in the middle of their career. So they drop out in order to take care of family, in order to be home with their children. And this means that many more men progress to senior leadership roles when women don't. And why is this important? And we think it's important because the barriers, the biases that produce gender inequality also prevent the creation of knowledge that can enable an inclusive and sustainable development. And so uh, what have we produced out of this? Out of our work with the University of Doma, we have this gender toolkit, which if you're interested in this type of work and if you want to talk, talk or start to talk about the issues that affect women in your institution, I'd highly recommend it. Um, it has six modules, as you can see. So um, essentially talking about gender mainstreaming, you know, the, the context within the country, setting an action plan. And within this, there's a full five-day workshop program. So if you wanted to run a workshop to start to talk about the issues that affect women in your institution, all of the tools are there. There are a number of activities to talk about. There's also an action plan at the end. So there's a template to set an action plan. So if your institution doesn't have a gender policy, for example, that's where this would come into it. So I'd highly recommend you can have a look at it. You can see at the bottom right-hand corner, inath.info slash gender toolkit. And the last uh, bit of work that we do within AuthorAid is building capacity within institutions to run training and research writing. And this is, you know, the work that we've been doing in Tanzania and other places. Um, we've limited it to 10 institutions in four countries. And this is because these are long-term relationships that involve institutionalizing training. So 
if someone's university doesn't necessarily provide any training in how to write and how to publish research, um, this is the gap that we're trying to fill. And at the minute, you can see we're working in Ghana, Sri Lanka, Tanzania, and Vietnam. What we do is we sign fairly long-term contracts, and we try to work to build the capacity of the senior people in an institution to train and to run face-to-face -face workshops. So um, we've also been working on developing online courses because a lot of universities now want to run online courses as well. Um, and developing an online course can be quite a lot of work, so it can involve um, not only understanding how to facilitate and teach in an online course, but it also involves a lot of technical stuff. So what's the platform that you're going to use? Do the people in your university know how to uh, use online platforms like that? So there are lots of things that go into that. Um, and we've also been working to build capacity for mentoring and supporting writing at an institutional level. And this is sort of what I referred to earlier. In many instances, there might not be a mentor within an institution who can support a researcher who needs it. So we're trying to support the development of that process. So there are often people who are there and who are happy to mentor, but there might not necessarily be the tools in place to support that relationship. It's usually a very easy thing to run once it's up and running, but it's just getting people to understand how it will work. That takes time. And we've had a lot of uh, really good feedback recently from some of the work that we've been doing. Um, and this is at the bottom of a quote from one of our um, academics at the Tanzanian Fisheries Research Institute, who said that she immediately, she took the online course last year and then immediately started putting her data together and writing a manuscript as a result of her PhD data. And she said that it had equipped her to take the test. The last thing that AuthorAid uh, supports is grants and funding. So we regret that we can't uh, support everyone who wants a grant. We do our very best to provide workshop and travel grants twice a year. Usually we offer five or six at a time. And a workshop grant provides an opportunity for uh, any institution to hold a workshop in either research writing, proposal writing, or communicating evidence to policymakers. Um, and what we do is we provide $2,500 US to put towards that, and people are able to use any of the workshop materials that we have with an author aid or to use their own workshop materials. At the bottom of the screen, there's a photo there from Guinea, um, where a researcher ran a, a, a medical writing workshop, and those are all the people who took the workshop. We also offer travel grants as well. So these are for early career academics, giving them the chance to present their research at an international conference. And this is really about giving somebody the opportunity who has not had the opportunity before to present. Um, and I should say that, as I said, we, we don't offer a lot of these, unfortunately, because of limits to funding. And we do get a lot of people um, who do apply for them. But I'd say just keep applying. We've just finished a round right now, and we'll have another round later this year. So check back on the website if you're interested. And that's me. I think that's exactly 35 minutes. So I've done my, <laughs> I've done my exact 35 minutes. You can see my email address there. Um, and yes, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much.